Hello everyone, uh, I'm Dr. Deepthi and we will be discussing yet another clinical case today. And today we will see how we would ask questions on contraception in a clinical manner, right? So we know a lot about a lot of contraceptives individually, but how do we integrate them into a clinical case scenario and which is very similar to when a patient comes to you in the OPT and you have to think about what would be the best contraceptive advice for this patient, right? So let's let's look at this question. So your patient is a 27 year old multi paris woman and she's in a monogamous relationship. She desires contraception, right? Now, uh, she has had a DVT while taking combination oral contraceptive pills. She's also forgetful about taking the pills every day and wants contraception that will allow spontaneity. She reports heavy menses. The physical examination is within normal limits. Which of the following is the best contraceptive advice for her, right? So that's very similar to when, when a patient walks up to your OPD or your clinic and, you know, desires contraception and is going to ask you for what you think is going to be the best option for her, although the choice still remains with the patient, right? So let's, let's see how we approach these clinical cases and and how we use different aspects that we've read individually and put them together. Uh, the key no thing here is to try and uh, identify the key words the uh, case is trying to tell you and then we would integrate them uh, you know uh, one by one. So our patient is in a monogamous relationship right and she has had a DVT in the past while she was taking combined oral contraceptive pills. She is also forgetful about taking pills every day. Then she reports heavy menses. Okay, she's looking for a contraceptive agent that gives her, uh, you know, spontaneity. The physical examination per se is normal. Now, the first very important, uh, you know, uh, information given to us here is that our patient had an episode of deep vein thrombosis when she was in OCPs and which makes all estrogen containing contraceptive agents uh, you know uh, not to be given in this patient so history of dvt or stroke or conditions which are hypercoagulable like coronary artery disease right in these conditions you know estrogen containing compounds are contraindicated so whether it is e alone or it is e plus p so that is why you're no longer going to prescribe her oral contraceptive pills now let us see what is relevant to us here in this MCQ with respect to combination of estrogen and progesterone. Let's look at option D first, right? So the option D is a vaginal ring, right? And the only thing that you needed to know to answer this question or rather I would say to rule out option D is that although vaginal ring is something that is inserted in the vagina, yes, and they look like this, right? But they are still E plus P contraceptive agents, right? So they are still E plus P contraceptive agents. And as a result of which, whatever are, you know, absolute contraindications of OCPs will also be absolute contraindications of vaginal ring. And in fact, they would also be absolute contraindications of a transdermal patch. Right. So although it is a transdermal patch, it is still going to release E and P systemically. So holds true for vaginal ring. OK, and I'm going to talk more about vaginal ring in a in a moment as well. Right. But as I said, the only thing you needed to know to rule out option D here is that vaginal ring is an E plus P compound. And then in a woman with DBT, right, stroke, coronary artery disease, it would be contraindicated right okay so you're able to see two contraceptive uh, devices here they're both rings right and this is what i want you to understand so we there are two rings that are available in the market so one is this which looks a little transparent right and um, this is actually the nuva ring okay so this is the nuva ring and you know when you talk about nuva ring uh, as I said, it is going to have E and P. So what is the P component here? It has etonogestrel. Okay. You also need to know that etonogestrel is a three keto derivative of desogestrel. So it's a derivative of desogestrel. And the E component here is ethinyl estradiol. 
right the etonogestural in the nova ring is released at the rate of 150 micrograms per day right uh sorry 120 micrograms per day and the ethinyl estradiol is released at the rate of 15 micrograms per day right so that's the composition of nuva ring and now what i want you to know is that another ring which looks more of an opaque and solid uh, not transparent like the other ring is uh, yet another new ring which is fda approved and it comes by the name of anovera okay it is also a e plus p device the p here in this is a progesterone which is segesterone okay so it has segesterone the e here is again ethinyl estradiol and the segesterone is released at the rate of 150 micrograms per day while the ethinyl estradiol is going to be released at the rate of 13 micrograms per day so what is different is yes their composition but what is also different is that you know both the rings are going to be applied in the vagina which are self inserted that's also important okay you need to know this uh, the patient can insert it by herself she doesn't need a a doctor to do it for her right so they're self inserted and the ring is going to remain in the vagina for 3 consecutive weeks okay so it remains in the vagina for 3 consecutive weeks then the ring is removed one week is going to be ring free so for one week there is going to be no ring in the vagina which is when she will have a withdrawal bleed and then she will have to put the ring again and this is where the difference comes nova ring has to be discarded okay which means every time a new ring has to be put right so you use it for 3 the patient is going to use it for 3 weeks one week is ring free and then she has to insert a new ring right so it has to be discarded whereas when you talk about anovera which has uh, segesterone this is a reusable ring that's the second difference between the two rings so it's a reusable ring and it can be used for a span of one year right so those are the two differences that i want, really want you to know uh, between uh, the two vaginal rings uh, please remember vaginal rings are highly effective methods of contraception okay not just that they are coitus independent by which we mean the patient does not have to remove them at the time of coitus okay they remain inside in the vagina at the time of coitus so it doesn't have to be removed every time right and it is a reversible method of contraception right so highly effective reversible and coitus independent the failure rates are exactly like ocp so if you look at the perfect use failure rate of a vaginal ring right it is 0.3 so everything is very similar to combined oral contraceptive pills so this is how we or what i want you to know about vaginal rings and why we have ruled out option d okay coming to option c option c is also not the answer here which is progesterone in only pills but what is written in the mcq which tells us that this would not be ideal for her so if you know something about progesterone pills um it will be easy to rule them out the most important thing about the progesterone only pill is they they have to be taken okay at the same time every day which means the person has to be very very compliant right so they have to be taken at the same time every day because they have you know uh, uh the effectivity is not going to last otherwise okay so uh since this patient already says that she was forgetful about the oc pills imagine another pill which she has to take not only every day but she has to take it every single day at the same time right so this is not the ideal thing for her although this this contraceptive device does not have estrogen so it is safe for her but it is not useful for her right let's look at option a so option a is also not the answer here so why is option a not the answer here so yes uh, dmpa is dipomedroxy progesterone acetate it is an injectable contraception uh, very effective right it is put under the category of lark right long acting reversible contraception right but what 
makes this not suitable for her and in fact the answer to this question is lng iud i will tell you why that would be the best choice for her but you know when you talk about um, depot medroxy progesterone acetate one of the important drawbacks is that there can be prolonged periods of of infertility after taking this which means there is going to be a delay in the return of fertility right so if this woman wants to you know conceive again uh, there will be a significant delay in the return of fertility an average of 12 months and sometimes it, it can extend to 18 months as well another thing which makes this a less better option than a mirena is because you know uh, although it is a lark a long acting method but again it has to be repeated every 3 months right and you know this particular patient we are talking about is not very happy about doing something at regular intervals because she feels she is not going to remember it right so these are the two reasons why we rule out dmp as not the best choice for her right so one is delay in the return of fertility and the second is that it has to be repeated every three months so the answer of choice here is going to be an lng iud or a mirena now let's see why we think or take mirena as the best choice for this patient number one uh, you know this is something which is user independent okay so once uh, she gets the mirena inserted it is approved for five years use right so not something that she has to do routinely every week or every month right so once put it is affected for a span of five years the other very important thing written in the MCQ is that she reports heavy menses and you know Mirena has certain uh, you know advantages which make it a very very favorable uh, contraceptive device. Not only it is also a LARC, so yes IUDs are also put under LARC, long acting reversible contraceptive methods but uh, you know the main action of Mirena is actually on the endometrium and we all know that it is going to release levonorgestrel and this device when it is you know when the progesterone exposure is continuously given to the endometrium it makes the endometrium thin and therefore it is going to significantly reduce menstrual blood loss so unlike copper tea which actually increases menstrual blood loss mirena actually reduces menstrual blood loss and that's what makes it very very effective for for all conditions or coexistent conditions in a woman where she desires contraception and she has problems of heavy bleeding for example it could be uh, you know uh, heavy bleeding due to endometrial hyperplasia right and because it makes the endometrium thin it is also protecting the endometrium from malignancy right so the non-contraceptive benefits of Mirena are usually linked to uh, what it does to the endometrium. So it protects the endometrium, it is going to reduce the menstrual blood draws, it will be very useful in patients of anemia. So if an, um, a significantly anemic patient is looking for contraceptive method, Mirena would be a good choice again. Then, uh, you know, they are also effective in pain, which could be because of endometriosis. So endometriosis related pain, um, you know, it is a very good uh, known contraceptive use of a Mirena and as well as, you know, women who have dysmenorrhea. So it actually reduces dysmenorrhea as well. Okay. The other important thing that I want to highlight here is this is a woman with DVT. So is Mirena a good choice for women with deep vein thrombosis? The answer is yes. Please remember this. AIMS people have been trying to ask questions in this respect. So Mirena is a very good device for women who have had episodes of DVP, DVT, deep vein thrombosis, or also on women who are on anticoagulation. And the two things are linked. So women who have had DVT are going to be on anticoagulant. So women on anticoagulants, if they ask you what is a good contraceptive choice for them it is again a mirena because it is going to reduce the blood loss in fact women who have bleeding disorders 
right can also be given mirena for the same reason okay it's going to reduce the menstrual blood loss so remember these non contraceptive benefits of mirena they are repeatedly asked in the exams in one form or the other right and as far as basics are concerned you should know that it has 52 mg of levonorgestrel it is highly effective it has a, a failure rate of 0.1% and it releases uh, lng at the rate of 20 micrograms per day right and as i have said before it is approved for a span of 5 years right so those are some very basic things that you should also know about mirena for the same reason it is also called as lng 20 because it's releasing 20 micrograms per day uh remember these two more names that you, uh, that i'm going to give you so one is called as skyla and the other is called as kylina okay these are also fda approved lng containing intrauterine devices but they all contain different amounts of lng for example skyla contains 13.5 mg and it is approved for 3 year use and kylina has 19.5 mg and it is approved for 5 year use right so i hope um, you know Uh, you've understood why lng iud is the best contraceptive advice for this patient so this is how we clinically correlate uh, questions in contraception by giving you case scenarios of different patients and we would ask you what would be the best suited device as per you right uh, for this particular patient so remember the non contraceptive benefits or their contraindications try and put them together and then answer the question i hope you find our clinical case discussion series useful we will be bringing up more such uh, uh you know clinical cases for you and uh, uh, join us on dams delhi youtube channel best wishes thank you so much